The moment has finally arrived. An unsuspecting rubber boy has officially made eye contact with this fearsome pigeon leopard, and thus punch fighting is imminent. I feel like I'm back in 2006, because that was the last time in my life that I was seriously anticipating a fight between Luffy and Rob Lucci. To start things off, I gave CP0 a lot of credit with the last chapter, perhaps even too much credit, because I said that their greatest skills are in being sneaky assassins rather than head on assaulters. So even though they're completely outgunned, they can still definitely do some damage. But then what do they do here? Immediately launch into a head-on assault. I feel like this world just has a different definition of the word assassin. However, one moment that gave me some serious chills was Rob Lucci ordering the abandoned ship. I love how quickly he was able to assess the situation as well as the sheer commitment to his mission here. It reminds me of the start of the raid on Onigashima, the way that Kinemon and the other samurai sank their ships after landing. Because it's either we succeed and we're fine or we fail, in which case the ships will be pointless anyway. So a really cool maneuver by Pigeon Brother, but this whole thing is almost like a reverse any slobby. CP0 blindly invading an island currently housing the Straw Hats, although I suppose to be fair it's not blind because Stussy does seem to remember quite a bit about the island itself. Not that Luchi or Kaku or anyone but Stussy knew that. Stussy saved all of that information until it was far too late to be particularly useful, but also Stussy recognized Atlas, which was kind of surprising. Because it means that the punk clones are much older than I thought they were, because Stussy seems to imply that the last time she was on Egghead Island was quite a long time ago. And speaking of Atlas, Lucci had not a modicum of chill when it came to her. He just snapped into chonk leopard form and devastated her with his ultimate attack, or at the very least what we know of as his ultimate attack. I mean, he probably has something even more ultimate now. That's what I really appreciate about Lucci as an antagonist though. He is a no-nonsense murder machine, a very efficient man who prefers to skip the effing around and go straight into the finding out. Even then, my CP0 highlight of the chapter was definitely Kaku. And look, I I'm quite biased because Kaku was always my favorite member of CP9. I just love that one of the most serious professional assassin dudes was transformed into a giraffe. Quite possibly nature's least subtle and most gentle of creatures. Apart from when they kick because they can like behead lions and stuff. And come to think of it, maybe that's why Kaku is a kick specialist with the Rokushiki. Hmm. But Kaku seems to have really come out of his giraffe shell in the past two years because he seems to have an almost completely different personality. Watching him explore all of the crazy crap on Egghead was nothing short of delightful. And it makes me think that under the right circumstances, Kaku would probably get along quite well with Luffy, Chopper, and Usopp, potentially even Frankie. In general though, this is just a really fun cypher pulse cell. CP0 so far have mostly been these like silent, stoic, and very humorless existence. But this trio of Luchi, Kaku, and Stussy are a really good concoction for comedy. And as such, this trio have placed themselves in a rather hilarious situation. They've invaded an island, abandoned their only method of retreat, and immediately cross paths with a member of the worst generation, an ex warlord of the sea, and a current emperor of the sea. If this wasn't a manga, this is where the Curb Your Enthusiasm music would start playing. And maybe, just maybe, a cat, a giraffe, and a woman heavily implied to be the head of an underground prostitution empire aren't quite fully equipped to handle what this island has cooked up for them. And as a man who can barely handle any kind of spice in cooking, I empathize deeply with their predicament. In fact, in a weird way, I almost find myself rooting for Luchi because he's now the underdog of the situation. Like instead of thinking, oh no, how's Luffy gonna get out of this one? I'm thinking, oh no, how is Luchi gonna turn this around. Because forget Luffy for a second, we also have Jinbei here, who has very recently defeated a more powerful, much larger, and almost certainly more racist cat in Who's Who. So even if we discount the Sun God, there is still a very solid match to be had here. Actually, I wonder if Jinbei's gonna bring up Who's Who. I'm not entirely sure why he would, but there is this weird triangle thing happening now, where Luchi knew Who's Who, Jinbei fought Who's Who, and now Jinbei is meeting Luchi who knew Who's Who. Who did it at a triangle. Luchi's reaction to this is actually quite difficult to read though. He does have the serious business odor under eye shading, so I suspect he's definitely feeling some of the old Luffy cravings right now, which I imagine to be like chewing on the fat of a steak. Very rubbery and kind of annoying. Don't like the fat. But what we have here is a fairly unprecedented situation, because Luffy has met a ton of former antagonists before, but they don't generally want to fight him again because Luffy has broken and shattered their fragile villain spirits. To be oddly fair in this case, one exception to this was Gekko Moria, who was still more than willing to pull his gothic vampire pants down, bend over, and get spanked by Luffy a second time during the Paramount War. Then again, I suppose Moria's spirit was broken long, long before he met Luffy, so I suppose there was no real damage left to do. I definitely get the impression that Luchi wants to fight, which isn't a surprise because his entire character can be basically summed up as, if it bleeds, I can, will, and have in fact already killed it while saying the sentence. But even then, I don't know if he will fight, primarily because killing Luffy isn't part of his current mission. But then again, Luffy probably isn't just gonna stand there and let CP0 kill the Vegapunks. 
probably. I mean, he's no hero, but at least one of them does have a very funny head. So battle punching seems inevitable. One of the most interesting aspects of the chapter for me though, is the mention of Sentamaru, who also happens to be a factor that could very much swing a much needed pendulum of power back into the favor of CP0. He gets a very weird mention in this chapter because Shaka orders command to the Seraphim to Sentamaru, implying that yes, he is indeed on the island and doing a very bad job of guarding the body bodies of Dr. Vegapunk, by the way, given that each and every Vegapunk have now encountered a potential pirate invader. But the way he's shown in this chapter is in this very heavily gray toned panel, which generally in this series denotes a memory or mental image. Like, is this Shaka thinking of Sentamaru rather than this is Sentamaru literally right here, right now? And the same thing happens with Atlas as well, which again, it was weird. But if you don't remember much about Sentamaru, I don't blame you because there was never really much to know. Essentially, he is the bodyguard of Dr. Vegapunk and allegedly possesses the strong Longest use of defensive armament hockey in the world, which would paint him initially as quite a Vegapunk loyalist, but Sentamaru does also have connections elsewhere, specifically to Kizaru, who he refers to as Ojiki, meaning uncle in a very Yakuza and not at all blood relative kind of way. Also post time skip, Sentamaru is a fully fledged Marine officer, so I wouldn't be too quick to count him as one of our allies here. And if he flips, then now he also takes three of the Seraphim with him. And if that were to happen, then I think the Straw Hats would have a legitimate cause to run. However, I have to say that Luffy versus versus Sentamaru is a rematch that I would be far more keen for than Luffy versus Luchi, because the last time Luffy fought against Rotun Sasuke, he had no chance whatsoever. So I'd love to see just how far Luffy has come in that regard. And maybe his advanced hockey shenaniganry could now actually penetrate the world's greatest defense. Also, just a small thing. During this whole section, there's a group shot of the Straw Hats with the Vegapunks, and Sanji is doing this like adorable protection pose against Robert in the background. And there's nothing really deeper to say about that. I just really like that subtle character moment. It's what makes One Piece worth really taking your time to read, or at the very least going back to reread the chapter after the initial hype has died down. The biggest news of this chapter, however, is not something said, but something shown, because we now have confirmation that both the original Kuma and the Seraph Kuma are using the same Devil Fruit ability. This is the first time in One Piece that we have had two confirmed concurrent users of the same Devil Fruit. And I mean this with no exaggeration, but this changes everything. Vegapunk is confirmed to now have the ability to either make copies of Paramecia Devil Fruits in addition to Zoan Fruit, or he has the ability to alter a being's lineage factor with the exact code required to replicate the fruit powers in question. Either way, this leads us into a brand new era because in theory, there is now no such thing as a unique devil fruit anymore. So long as Vegapunk can study the fruit user's lineage factor, that power can then be duplicated. This is very good news for Senor Pink though, because it significantly reduces the chances that he had to die so that his swim swim fruit could be given to a cyborg fish. The other exciting thing is that Kuma is definitely coming to Egghead Islands now, right? Which which means that I think we're in for some very heartbreaking Bonnie story happening quite soon. And maybe Kuma will end up saving the Straw Hats and Bonnie one last time by just like booping the Sunny off the island before potentially sacrificing his rather large and bear himself. But there is also the question of whether or not Kuma is still alive, considering he does still have his Devil Fruit powers. Theoretically, if he did die and was completely like cyborganized, then the powers would disappear and go elsewhere into another fruit. But then again, maybe the slow conversion into cyborg tricked the magical fruit powers into thinking that Kuma Kuma was still alive. I honestly don't know which one I'd prefer. If there was still a sliver of Kuma in there to make one last stand, or if there was a final legacy programmed into Kuma to do the same thing. But also Mr. Dr. Vegapunk has a rather extreme dream of free infinite energy for the entire world, which in turn leads to Egghead Island becoming Ohara all over again, because Vegapunk has been a very naughty old apple man and has been investigating taboo ancient energy sources. And all of that, look, it's nice and all, but Luffy's reaction was the absolute highlight of the chapter for me. He semi politely listens to the old man's ambitions and dreams and basically says, that's cool and all, but I don't care because I've got pirate stuff to do. And I just love Luffy's purity of being. Like not pure in the sense of good and innocent and all of the that, but more in the unapologetic, this is what I am sense. And the whole not wanting to be a hero is perfectly understandable with the fairly recent focus on freedom because being a hero comes with a ton of responsibility. I mean, they're expected to do like good things to benefit the societies. And man, that, that sounds like an awful lot of responsibility and not at all being free. It even makes me think back on stuff like the Grand Fleet. Luffy's official rejection 
rejection statement was, it'll cramp my style. But going deeper, becoming their leader would have meant responsibility. And responsibility is pretty much the antithesis of freedom. All of this is very much pointing towards some sort of utopian ending for One Piece though. As in there will come a day when the world government has been beaten, the entire world has free unlimited energy, so no more wars, all disease has been cured by a reindeer, and the red line has been torn down, thus uniting everyone to live happily ever and after the end. All of which will be incidentally caused by Luffy pursuing his own selfish dream. But the Egghead Island arc seems to be ramping up to a conclusion pretty rapidly. And I think it's a shame that we haven't had more adventure time on the island, because this is quite possibly the most fun and exciting location we've ever been to. And something very subtle is that this chapter had a lot of interaction from the residents of Egghead Island, who up until now have been completely kept in the shadows. So who are these people? Are these people even people? They could be cyborgs or holograms maybe, and whatever they happen to be, are we just going to abandon them all? Because introducing a whole society does add complications, because now we can't just run. We've probably got to do something to save or safeguard Egghead Island and its citizens before leaving. And actually something I haven't thought of is that Kuma very much has the answer to everything. His powers are how CP0 got on the island, and if OG Kuma is on his way, then his powers could also be how we rid them from the island without needing to get into an extensive drawn out fight. Because the more I think about it, the more I keep landing on the fact that Luffy literally used Kaido as a jump rope. So I really don't know if a combative situation is really the way that Luchi quite wants to take this. Instead, let's take you to this next video because whatever you're doing right now, you know that it will only get better with some guy on the internet talking about fictional pirates to no end by your side.